Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's podcast is looking at the limits of orthodontic tooth movement and is a combination of two lectures, one given by Dr. Yankee Yang and the second by the giant Carlos Flores Mur. Just to recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and may not be 100% representative of the original lecture. We try our best to ensure that it is. It is the independent work of myself and the orthodontics and summary team. Now getting back to the lectures. The first lecture by Dr. Yankee Yang established what are the anatomical limits of orthodontic tooth movement, and looking at things in three planes of space. The first is distalization in the lower arch of the second molar. The second is horizontal movements into an atrophic ridge. And the third is what are the effects of the maxillary sinus? I thought each one of these three questions were an interesting one to explore within the literature. So starting off looking at distalization, when it comes to distalizing the second molar, there are different limits for both the crown and the apex. Coronally, the limits are the vertical aspect of the anterior border of the mandibular ramus. Apically, however, it is the lingual plate, and that owes itself to the orientation of the second molar. Now, the distance really varies from patient to patient when it comes to the distance between the molar distal root as well as the lingual plate. When is it favorable, when it is unfavorable? Well, actually, Dr. Yankee Yang looked into this and in types of malocclusion impacts on what the morphology of the patient is. In class three cases, we have more space in the retromolar region. However, in class two cases, there is far less. And that is favorable, because actually we are looking to distalize more commonly in our class three cases. Other variables include the patient's facial type. If the patient is hyperdivergent, there is less bone which is available and hypodivergent or low angle cases have more bone available. That fits into our understanding from other research, such as for mini screws, where hyperdivergent patients appear to have a difference in the bony morphology compared to low angle patients. What are the side effects that take place from distalizing? I thought this was an interesting point for Dr. Yankee Yang to look into. One of the main challenges with distalizing low arch is that the tooth movement type is mainly tipping with true distalization in the lower arch only consisting of around about one millimeter. There's also anatomical challenges. Due to the morphology of the lingual plate, there's a good chance to make contact with the lingual plate in a third of all cases. What about horizontal restrictions of the atrophic ridge? Dr. Yang looked into it and looked at what are, what are the changes that take place after the tooth extraction? Well, the width and the height reduces, but it's more the width than the height around about 3.7 millimeters of width reduction after extraction and 1.2 millimeters of height reduction in that site. And most of this takes place from the first six months following an extraction. So when it comes to orthodontic tooth movement into an atrophic ridge, what takes place? Well, actually the height seems to respond favorably. There's an increase in the height of around two millimeters. But actually when it comes to the width changes, those are very small and subtle changes of around 0.8 millimeters to 1.6. And that's Stokeland's paper from 2011. What that indicates to us is that actually moving a tooth into an atrophic ridge means that we can't ever restore the full height of the bone. And the majority of the height may return, but actually the width is still restricted. And that brings us on to the side effects of having tooth movement in an atrophic ridge. And those side effects that take place are root resorption, mainly on the lateral aspect of the root. And that's on average 0.7 millimeters. But interestingly enough, Dr. Yankee Yang described how in the research that was shown in nearly every case where it took place. There's also dehiscences that can occur. While they are very slight, they do still take place. And the understanding is as a tooth moves into an atrophic ridge, there may be restoration of the height, but the width doesn't really change. And therefore root resorption and dehiscences can then take place. What about the vertical limitations? Well, looking at the maxillary sinus and how and if it can actually prevent tooth movement taking place. What was shown from the research that actually a low sinus can result in reduction in tooth movement taking place, but also an increased likelihood of tipping occurring as well. What are the side effects of a tooth moving where there's a low sinus? Well, there's an increased risk of root resorption, although Dr. Yankee Yang stated it is a mild increase in that process. Interestingly enough, the research has looked at relapse, vitality, and periodontal differences and shown that there is no difference when it comes to it. The tooth most susceptible to this as a process is the upper six 
buccal root which is the closest to the sinus. And the understanding from the process is that the maxillary sinus remodels itself as tooth movement approaches it. However, there's an increased resistance to that tooth movement, therefore there is an increased risk of iatrogenic changes such as root resorption and tipping taking place in orthodontic movement. The second half of this podcast, we'll be looking at what are the periodontal limits of orthodontic tooth movement. Professor Carlos flores Mur gave a thought-provoking statement how Prophet established what is the envelope of orthodontic tooth movement, but what are the periodontal limits is still yet to be defined. He's described the difference between a gingival biotype and gingival phenotype, and how the biotype is a simplistic term that relates simply to the thickness in a buccolingual direction. Phenotype is more involved. It also describes the contour of the gingiva, the underlying bony architecture, as well as the width of the cretinized tissues. Now, there are factors which modify a patient's response to their periodontum when it comes to orthodontic tooth movement. Simple things such as just having trauma. And he stated trauma can be iatrogenic, such as expansion to the first molar can result in trauma to the first molar root. Likewise, simply retraction of a canine. If contact takes place between the canine eminence, that will result in trauma occurring. Next, Carlos Flores Moore explored several factors that have been proposed for recession and dehiscences. The first is treatment decision making of extraction versus non extraction. I'm delighted to say Dr. Carlos Flores Moore referenced our blog from some months ago looking to detail into this topic. What an honour it was to have our document appear on stage. He described how, whether it's extraction or non extraction, there can be bone loss that takes place, although in different amounts and in different places. He also explored how dehiscences can be present prior to even starting treatment. That can range from 40 to 50% within the population. That gingival biotype, how thick the gingiva is, does impact the risk of recession occurring. And the thicker it is, the less likelihood of having recession occurring. He also explored how oral hygiene still remains the biggest known factor to result in, periodon- to result in recession occurring and therefore loss of tissue. Can we assess what's going to happen? Well, CBCTs offer a great range of information. However, in Carlos Flores' Mer's words, they aren't telling us the whole story. He mentioned how a CBCT data, when it comes to looking at the voxel size, is limited, and any defect smaller than 0.6 millimeters won't actually appear. And we get a number of false positives occurring as a result. And this means that actually it can look worse in a CBCT da- CT data than actually it is in real life. He also looked at loan size of proclination, that component which is considered to be the hallmark of orthodontic treatment. And we presume the more we procline teeth, the more recession occurs. However, the systematic reviews that have looked into this topic haven't shown a strong correlation, and we don't know exactly what will take place. Ultimately, Carlos Flores' Mer's thoughts and opinions were that recession can take place if there's a thin gingiva, if there is significant proclination, and in the light of periodontal disease. And in conclusion, Carlos Flores Mer described the etiology of gingival recession as being complex, and how orthodontics features as one of those factors. There are other factors of the patient's morphology, but also of the patient's habits. And a combination of these three factors are what results in recession. That's it for me. A quick update. It's been a busy couple of weeks as we've run our IPR course back to back. It's been really exciting sharing knowledge with you guys in person. I've also hosted a roundtable discussion with Aligners, which you'll hear from shortly. I'm really excited and looking forward to our annual meeting with Simply Author Group over in November in Dubai. It's going to be really exciting. And to thank our new sponsor, TOC Dental, as well as the continued support and sponsorship from the Aligner Intensive Fellowship for this podcast and blog work that we do. As always, please do subscribe and look forward to seeing you in the next episode.